I'm gonna pop over into the frame for beautiful the kickoff. Okay. And we're live here from the MIT Media Lab. Um, this uh, I'm Daza Greenwood. I'm Brian Wilson. And we are the co-instructors for the 2020 MIT Computational Law Course, an IAP offering that's now in its fifth season. And uh, today is final presentation day for all the participants in the class. Um, and so uh, why don't we kind of get right into that um, with uh, the, it looks like a, oh, Andre, uh, you are with us. Uh, so Andre, uh, are you, Ready to yeah, present? Yeah, uh, uh, Great. Why, why don't you? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm ready. Why don't you? Why don't you? Uh, I'm listening. Um, screen uh, to do screen share, and then um, go, you have have uh, five minutes uh, to introduce yourself and talk us through your presentation on um, the use of blockchain and be able to promote transparency and ensure accountability for government actions. Just, just let me see if I, I, I can can put the slides because I'm not using my computer. I was, as I, I, I told you, I was in, I, I am in vacation and I, I'm improvising in a, in a bed. Then I will try to, to put the presentation. I can, I can pull them up uh, if you need, need us to. And just by okay. way of background for everybody who's watching this um, later on after the fact, we are having all the participants in the course who decided to submit a final project walk through and say five minutes about what their presentation is and show us any slides or uh, other materials that they've prepared for this. Indeed. And uh, Andre, if it's helpful, uh, we, we can go to Neha first and then come back to yeah, you. Would, yeah, yeah. Would that be I, I better? Will, I will prepare the, all the, the I, I think I will be able to, to present. I, I found how to, to, to do this by, by the iPad. Uh, but Neha could present first and then, then I, I go later. Okay, that's, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, so uh, Neha, um, if, if you are ready, uh, we would love to hear your presentation on tax as a computational system, and especially your experience um, trying to basically specify something that could be buildable and what you learned from that. Yeah. So uh, Neha, welcome, Great. Uh, and let me you're try on. sharing my screen. Yep. So what I was working on was I was trying to create a class and the idea was what would it look like if instead of laws the IRS put out just code and then you could feed in your own numbers into the IRS's code and that would be the single source of truth for what your taxes are, what your tax liability is, what tax deductions you get. It was just a thought experiment so I guess my goal was to turn laws which are on the left side I have an example law which is I think 26 USC 1014 which de describes what happens when people inherit property and turning it into code so something like what's on the right side which is just pseudocode and in the process of thinking through what this would look like I was trying to you know measure twice cut once to be really careful about what the system will look like and then code it only once but the problem was so dense that I spent all of my time measuring and I didn't actually get to write much code at all. But I just wanted to talk about here what problems I ran into when trying to go from left to right, trying to go from English to code. So the problem was just how to simplify code. And I took inspiration from what one of my professors did for over corporate law class. So what he did was we had we were looking at Delaware corporate law statutes and an example of one is on the left. And he has a website, simplifiedcodes.com, where he's taken all the Delaware statutes that are important in corporate law and he's just written them in simpler English. It's still not entirely simple, but it's a lot easier to understand if you're A, just coming in as a student, or B, if you just want to know the outlines of what a law does without knowing all the little 
finicky details. So this is sort of similar to what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take English laws and convert them into a very simplified version. So let's take again 1014 as an example, which is the law that describes what happens when property is inherited. And I, the problems I ran into mainly fell into three buckets that I've highlighted in different colors here. So first is purple. It says, except as otherwise, uh, except as otherwise provided in this section. So that seems simple, but when people are handling the system, because when you want to decide what the exceptions are, you can look at everything else in the section, or you can take it to court and the court will tell you what tax laws take priority over others. But when you're doing it in the computer, you need to know what the exact priority order will be to be able to code it correctly. And that requires, you know, making explicit things that are just implicit right now because you won't have the court to help you. The second problem I ran into was duplicates. This is something lawyers love doing, where they'll say something and they'll insert an or, and then they'll say something again in the same, that has the same meaning, but in different words. And there are edge cases where a situation might be covered by A and it won't be covered by B. But if you're trying to simplify things, ideally you wouldn't have duplicates at all. If you're trying to write the system from scratch, you would only say things once and make sure that saying it once encompasses all the cases you need to encompass. Then problem three is sometimes the tax code asks for things that are really hard to find. Like here, it wants you to find the fair market property of inherited value at the date that the original owner died. But this is information that's really hard for people to know. On the day that a loved one dies, you're not going to be trying to evaluate the fair market value of their property. And in real life, I think we fudge it. We assume that we have the information when we don't. So a person who's relying on this code, they'll just put in the fair market value on the day that they evaluate the property. They won't look at the date that the descendant died. But if it's on a computer, you don't want to use fudge factors. You want to have the code describe exactly what it wants the computer to do. So you would either rewrite the law or you would try to pull in information that you might not have access to easily. So those are the three problems I ran into. But I think if we address these, the reach goal would be to create something like what my bank currently does for me. It tells me my credit score, but not only that, it tells me what I can do to improve it and where I'm failing. And I think this would be really cool to have for tax, where not only do you know how much you owe the tax the IRS, but you also know what can you change to decrease your tax liability? What can you do differently with your assets to make them simpler to understand, to reduce your paperwork, to reduce the time you spend filing taxes, whatever metric you want to measure it on. So that's what I did the last two weeks. Outstanding. Awesome. Congratulations, nice work. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe I could get the discussion started with one question. Um, if you were attempting to codify, um, say for example, that, that rule on, um, you know, uh, on death tax, um, would, you, would you look to, do you think it would be a better strategy or what are the pros and cons? of a strategy of uh, having the legislation or the, or the reg express uh, the fair market value of the decedent's property, um, you know, uh, on average during like the, uh, the quarter of the year of their death. So that's something that you could maybe, you know, get some market markers for, you know, like similar properties that were selling, or if it was experiencing like a precipitous decline or increase in value based on some neighborhood or, 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 or sort of, or, or on the other hand, go the other direction, more of a typical legal um, mealy mouth direction and say like a, within a reasonable time of the decedent's death, for example, or, 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 or what other strategies do you think might make that less obscure and more, um, more objective uh, to be able to measure? I think that's a, that goes back to the discussion that we always have in law school about rules versus standards, where rules are really specific, but they create a lot of weird edge cases that don't necessarily have the best outcomes. And standards are, like the lawyers love saying, in a reasonable time. But then they're so vague that you end up having to go to court a lot more to litigate exactly what reasonable means. 
And I think if you're using a computer to codify tax law, you should take advantage of the fact that it, A, can do computations really cheaply, and B, it loves specific information. So I think I would go with the first alternative you suggested, which is something like within the quarter of the debt that gives the inheritors enough time to get their affairs in order, but it also gives the computer specific information that's not too onerous to get, but the computer likes having you know, numbers instead of reasonable standards, and then you can reduce the amount of time people spend going to court. And then actually, I'm just gonna, a quick follow-up. Uh, have you heard of um, programming languages like Prologue? No, I don't think I've worked with that one. Okay, so that's something maybe we can, well, everyone should just Google it. Um, and uh, it's a, um, a logic-based uh, um, language. It's very they call it declarative. Um, and um, one of the things that it does is um, it, um, it, it requires um, being very explicit about things like the, um, uh, basically like the, the priors and the, uh, the um, you have to sort of declare up front um, you know, what the, the, you know, what the assumptions are um, and what the axioms are going to be. And then every rule is stated in, some, in, in, a, in a simplified version of pure logic. Um, so looking at things like the duplicates, um, but like basically each each of those rules would be able to be like uh, atomized into its own expression that you know may reference other rules in part or distinguish itself from other rules and have different you know kind of criteria. But but each thing is declared more or less, and um, and they're all parsable um, logically, um, so that you know it's very easy to <clears throat> um, to do something like formal verification yeah. um, or Uh, certain inferences that you kind of draw from them in natural language, which but they would be different from the inferences that you would um, in some, express in some some uh, language like prologue, um, you know, that are very specific about what's you know included and what's assumed not included and what the um, what you can deduce from that. <clears throat> so anyway, there, there'd be a lot of relearning for people if there ever were like a formal um, syntax and kind of grammar for um, computational expression of law in the way that you're talking about to make it um, completely clear and unambiguous uh, that may, may be somewhat beyond what's realistic for lawmakers and, and lawyers to, to be able to master. Yeah, and I, I think too there's probably some lesson to be learned about um, because of some vulnerable some error or some certain circumstance. Yeah. Um, so so uh, I think a lot of people have started incorporating by reference some of like the underlying principle. Uh, and while where, you know, something kind of like contest it and go back and see, does this actually fit within the principles yeah. that we have for this program, yeah. for this algorithm? Yeah. And then you can reevaluate it um, under, you know, the right set of principles, yeah. essentially. And so we come back to the common law of like, you know, having like, a, you know, people with the ability to reason at some point, um, setting parameters and making judgment calls about what's in and what's out. The, the computational common law. <laughs> CCL. Um, any other feedback or questions or comments on, on Neha's presentation? Well, I think we should just thank Neha for a great presentation and a thoughtful, uh, yeah. very thoughtful project. Thank you, Neha. Right, thank I, I think uh, that. Thank you. Great. And uh, Andre, I think you're, um, if you're ready, uh, we're ready for you um, to, um, to go next. Okay. I will. Yeah, uh, I will, will charge the 
Oh, if you if you want, I can share your slides on my side, and you can just tell me when to advance. Yeah. Yes. If 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 it's possible, it's Brian speaking. No. Yes. Yep. Um, if it's possible, it's better. I, I was trying to connect with Google Drive, but I, I'm on. Uh, if I have a very bad connection here, and okay. I'm some time, and we okay. Thank you. Okay, so just tell me. Well, uh, my uh, okay. Uh, I, I will. I will tell when when we, we can pass to, to the next slide. Uh, uh, first first of all, I, I want to present myself. Uh, I am André Guskov Cardoso. I'm Brazil here. I, I work with uh, um, regulation and public law in general, administrative law. And for a while, I've been studying uh, the use, especially the use of technology in public law. And one specific uh, field of this is the use of DLT in general, or distributed ledgers, technologies, and blockchain. Very, very rich field in which we can uh, evolve. And I think that it's possible to enhance the 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 role of the state and then don't, if you can go to the next slide slide please yep. oh. Oh. okay okay is that it sorry we we can we can start by by some some initial consideration so. We, we know that despite all, all efforts, despite all legal provisions in polls and transparency, gov governments in general, governments in the U.S., in Brazil, in Europe, uh, are still difficult to citizens to comprehend the times and oft, very often confusing, contradictory in various sense, and antiquate. Uh, we, we, we can uh, perceive the lack of use of current and available technology. We, 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 uh, everyone uh, has the experience, has probably has, has, has had the experience to, to be in a, in, a, in a public department and, and think well, what, what I'm, I'm doing here. Probably all this uh, situation, all this, this, formalities could be done uh, by the web. We're still in the stone age when we, we deal with, with governments. But uh, uh, this, this is a, 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 a con in, in, in a sense is a contrasense because if we, we still see experiences in the stone age, uh, there are some fields of government that are very, 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 uh, advanced and use advanced technologies and and usually we see this with the tax authorities they're very eager and very uh, very good at using new technologies to detect uh, frauds detect uh, uh, and so on and then and, and this is this is a problem that dlt is and and blockchain could uh, deal with, could tackle with. It's all these considerations, all, all this, this situation. And just a quick time check, we've got about a minute uh, and a half remaining. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go very, very, very rapid, very, very fast to, to, the, to the, could lead to lack of trust in government, corruption, inefficiency. And I, I, in the presentation, I, I, I made some citations of Honor O'Neill, Francis Fukuya, and even a, a, a um, and scheme of But we, we need to, to know how to deal with this. 
with this situation. And to, to do this, governments need to act more and truly transparent possible to do both, to achieve both goals by using uh, DLTs and blockchain technology. And there are, are pilots, program pilots, uh, using this kind of technology uh, in Brazil, in the US, I, I mentioned the, in the slide 12, the, uh, uh, um, an initial program at US Treasury uh, that we use blockchain-based uh, grants payment system to, in order to control. And all this, uh, in Europe, the ecosystem of blockchain is being discussing a lot, uh, it's there its possibilities and its uh, probabilities to use. Uh, we 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 even discussed the use of smart contracts to reduce bureaucracy and to limit the discretionary government action. And this goes exactly to the idea of computational law. Uh, uh, blockchain platforms and DLTs could be uh, a solid platform to use. Uh, to enhance and to to per, to government action, enhance uh, uh, transparency and accountability. Uh, we, we have a lot of constraints, and this, this is our these are difficult that we can see all over the world. A lack of proper infra infrastructure, uh, immaturity of the technology inside government itself. Need to. The, develop the skills inside government, need to convince governments of the benefits of the use of this technology. And uh, 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 the problem that we have to convince the public bodies that they probably they will, will, will have to, to renounce to, to some, some power to, to use this kind of, uh, of tools that will enhance government actions. And we have uh, some other problems too, uh, as the, 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 the risks with personal data and privacy. Uh, we have uh, a necessary evolution of the legal reason and, and courts of understanding, as, as Niha has already mentioned. It's difficult to, to convert, it's difficult to translate uh, legal code uh, in uh, digital code, this is very difficult. It's very, very difficult to to translate to 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 make to 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 make a, a smart contract based on blockchain. But this, uh, we, we can say that this is a long way forward. But they are very prom promising uh, technologies and very promising uh, ways to to do this with the use of DLT and blockchain technologies. And this, this is the, the general idea. We, we can go to, to discussion and we can, we can see if we, thank you. Thank you for managing the, 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 the slides. Yeah. Excellent, thank, thank you. Uh, great presentation, uh, I wanna say. And um, uh, since I thank you. sucked up so much uh, time on the last discussion, let me open the floor to uh, anybody that uh, has any uh, feedback or questions or comments on Andre's presentation. Um, and if you're online, just come off mute and start talking. I, I think the fraud use case is a really interesting one because it, it's, uh, it lines up with a lot of the traceability and immutability that blockchain has. And I think you know a lot of people can get involved with different certification schemes where you have to prove the origins of maybe where um, certain funds came from for political donations or things like that to show, to actually, um, you know, verify um, some sort of like uh, well, formally verify that you have, uh, you know, funds that are from legitimate sources instead of funds from, you know, sh shadowy car wash sort of <laughs> things. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is Bob Taylor. Um, from Liberty Mutual. And I, I would just add on to the fraud use case. I really like your presentation. I think there's tremendous upside to what you're talking about, um, especially when it comes to professional licensing. So like if you're hiring somebody that's supposed to have a valid professional license, there'd be a very easy one source of truth to be able to check. And if that licensing has to come from a government entity, um, or even if you need like a certificate of insurance, 
right? Yeah. Um, it, but anything that's issued from a government entity that I want to know that the contractor is licensed in the state of Massachusetts to do work of this type, I don't have to rely on the contractor or word of mouth. Mm -hmm. There's an easy way for me to verify that. I think this transparency certainly is. Yeah, I know, that. I know the the town of Zug in Switzerland did their entire land registry on Ethereum, mm -hmm. so that I think is another case for you know something something like that. Yeah, indeed. Um, any other feedback from um, more participants? Yeah. Okay. Hear, hearing none, uh, I'll just end by saying there's a t technology that you should put on your radar. Um, I'm not, I don't actually even think this is the right, this is not final or ready for, you know, wide scale deployment, but it may be points of direction. And, and um, that would be <clears throat> um, 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 basically so-called verifiable claims, uh, which is a worldwide web consortium um, cryptographic protocol um, that um, involves basically three parties, uh, the issuer of a claim. So in, um, in uh, Bob Taylor's example, it might be the, um, uh, like um, the insurance commissioner of a state that can say whether someone is, you know, licensed to sell insurance in that state. So they've got like a, or, or the board of bar overseers in Massachusetts that says like that's a, is a licensed attorney or is not, or is retired status or whatever. Um, so it's an authoritative source. Uh, the person about whom the claim is made, um, and then a like third party that is like wants to see and be able to verify the claim. And basically, it's just like it's always it's a rudimentary application of public key cryptography with a digital signature. It just sort of a, takes a hash of the claim, um, digitally signs the claim, um, and then has a, a, a standard syntax to associate that with uh, with like a, with like an envelope of the claim and. and pointers to where you can verify it, some other um, bells and whistles. And it has the property of allowing the person who the claim is about, like the, you mentioned a certificate of insurance, I actually have a client from consulting who has informed me that, you know, to go forward, um, here on out, like they need to be listed as, uh, as a beneficiary and they additional need a, sure. a, additional sure, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> it takes <Yeah. laughs> an insurance guy. I should actually ask you about this uh -huh. um, after class. But uh, and, and a certificate of insurance that shows it's you know, kind of paid up and what's covered, and liability, and workers' comp, and things. And so, if I actually had that from my um, uh, um, insurance company, I could just send it, uh, and they could verify it with the insurance company. But it wouldn't have to be another workflow to get another one every time from the insurance company because they could verify it with the public key, and you could have a verification database or whatever. But these are some of the types of um, protocols and um, implementations that could maybe be. Um, are architected and orchestrated together to form something like a legal infrastructure that would support um, that would support the transformation you're talking about at, at a larger level, Andre. So everybody, um, Google verifiable claims and see what you think of it. Okay, so next up we have we promised you Christina, and we're going to deliver okay. Christina. You're up. Okay. Okay. Can you manage my slides? Uh, let me get them pulled up. Um, just a moment. Yes, we can. And uh, we're, we're just, uh, uh, Brian, Brian's going to be the, um, the maestro. OK. And this is on um, personal data for sale and EU and a yeah. perspective. So what could be more comparative? Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, this course uh, is really um, bringing to me many ideas and that's fantastic for our researcher. Just, uh, just introduce myself. I'm a lawyer and specifically I'm a comparative lawyer. So I'm focusing, for example, of comparative law and blockchains or uh, comparative law and computational legal systems, so quite an, an interesting um, perspective of this uh, um, hybrid hybridization between law and technology. My presentation uh, is about personal uh, data um, as a counter performance. Um, I'm looking uh, to the uh, comparative perspective on the problem of trading personal data. 
uh, that's the main point. We, we had a meeting uh, in Milan uh, where we were discussing uh, within the European Law Institute uh, about uh, the problem of uh, transferring or trading personal data in the European Union and where I'm based. Um, the problem is that the EU is in, I mean, in between the philosophy of economics and the philosophy of identity, to quote uh, the philosopher Floridi, in uh, considering personal data, in the sense that we have two main uh, legal provisions. I'm, I'm just telling this for American colleagues who are not aware of the state of the art in the EU. One is the famous GDPR, and the other one is the consumer contracts. Um, we have a directive, uh, consumer contracts directive, and then we have another directive on the supply of digital content. So the EU is quite a um, complex legal landscape. But basically, the result of the interpretation of the legal framework uh, brings us to say in the EU that the picture is unclear in the sense that it seems that we, what we can do is to border, uh, what I define as bordering, personal data for having uh, as an exchange uh, trivial services. Uh, next, in the next slide, um, I question the grounds of such a system of exchange we have in the EU, in the sense that we base this on the informational model and uh, the, 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 the consent of the people by saying, um, we provide you information, we get your consent, and we can exchange uh, your personal data for very trivial services. Uh, consent is based on the notion we use in contract law, in competition law, in privacy. Uh, it, this is a, quite a, a paradox in the sense that um, some economists have pointed out the sense that people in the EU is not perceiving that personal data as a great value. They, they think it has, but at the end they are re ready to exchange personal data for very trivial services. So what's, what's the problem? We, we could not uh, openly discuss of ownership uh, in the sense of uh, trading because of the fact that part of the legal scholarship is um, very keen to protect the idea that the personal data are part of your life, so this is a matter of fundamental rights, and you cannot trade yourself. Uh, to quote uh, Bowman, the, the sociologist, uh, the consumer is now the product, in the sense that you are trading part of your life. So the problem is to find a legal category for something new because of technology. And uh, there, there are many different perspectives. One is data protection, the other one is market, the other one is what people are doing in reality, because we are already exchanging personal data for services with a number of US companies <laughs> indeed. So the problem is to find a way um, to categorize but, or to create a new understanding. Um, the problem is also a problem of remedies. When you decide you are not so happy of this bordering, what you can obtain as a, as a person, as a consumer, you can ask termination, restitution of data, uh, you can have the right to know how companies are using your data, but what you can obtain at the end is a sort of data set that the majority of common people could not understand indeed. So all these rights that are provided by the GDPR are not very effective if you decide to terminate the trading, the exchange of data for services. What's the conclusion? I'm looking by taking part to this uh, course uh, to get new understanding of a wider picture, but I'm very interested to know about the uh, understanding of colleagues from other countries, especially from the US. Uh, I'm going to write a paper on this. So I would like to understand solutions you, are, you have or you are dealing with. I'm, I'm aware about the state of the art in the US. I'm aware of the new act in California, if I'm right. But I would like to understand how you manage the same problem to get new ideas to me. One option is uh, um, to think in terms of leasing uh, a data set uh, to companies for a limited time. 
or to consider data not as goods but as IP rights. Uh, that, that's an option. Uh, I question the point uh, someone has raised during the course that the GDPR is based on civil law. I'm, I'm very interested to know why uh, our uh, colleague is thinking so, um, because this is a quite an interesting comment. And um, so I'm trying to find a solution. Individually, the data borrowing is not so bad. I mean, the problem is the collective dimension of this in the sense that by giving data to so many companies, you have some sort of liquid surveillance, to quote Bowman, in the sense that data sets are giving companies the possibility to know um, your life indeed. So thank you very much for the time and for your attention. I hope to get your comments. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Great presentation. Again, we're on a roll. Um, it, it, so one quick thing, um, she's in Davos right now, but oh, nice. uh, a friend of our, of the MIT computational law um, program and um, <clears throat> frequent collaborator uh, is uh, Elizabeth Reneris. So we should get you in touch with her. Yeah. Um, she's done deep work in on exactly these issues, um, for, you know, largely from a European perspective, but but she's United States uh, attorney and um, is very deep in the comparative law uh, approach for personal data protection and you know, from from a in, from a individual's perspective. Uh, and one of the things that she um, would really emphasize now, I think, if she were here. Is uh, is um, understanding the type of legal thing that the personal data is, uh, and um, she, you know, I think there's there's aspects of it once it's reduced to data that I think clearly are 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 can be classified as property, a type of personal property that happens to be intangible, like under IFRS or, or GAP or whatever. But um, but there's another dimension of it as well, and it gets to these um legislative and um and deeper jurisprudential legal frameworks that sounds more like in human rights um especially from a european perspective and some of those uh from those perspective aspects of it may not be alienable uh, th th there's a inalienable universal um dimension that makes it harder to kind of encapsulate and and uh and like um sell like property or even lease or license potentially much less barter. The, the other thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, this new vantage point of, uh, on um, surveillance capitalism, so-called, um, I think has made a lot of very useful distinctions, but the, the chief one is, is to get deeper from the slogan that the, if you're not paying, then you're the product or the person is the product. And, and the, they have more of a real politic vantage point, which is we're not even actually the product. If you look at what the companies um, and agencies that are um, that actually create value from the personal data are selling or, or the value the value moment It's not literally what we gave them. We didn't give them the product We gave them a closer analogy would be the raw materials that they refine into a product So it would be more like a like an oil field or like a granite ditch or something um, <laughs> uh, uh, which you know doesn't in some ways doesn't change the idea that we're providing a valuable resource, but it does change like where we are in the life cycle, and it also suggests you know like you know, there's certainly been people that have um, collected that have uh, you know formed um, collectives uh, that own like oil fields uh, or that own you know uh, for, for tall farmland or, or or have other property rights and know how to get together and uh, negotiate a better deal with companies that want to extract those uh, more raw materials uh, in order to um, refine them into products and so that they can be a fair value exchange at the right point. But understanding, you know, getting more definition on what is the type, what is the legal thing that we want to um, define personal data as, I think will, um, will, will help us um, identify maybe more useful legal frameworks going forward. Yeah, and, and building on that a little bit, like looking at uh, environmental regulations as kind of the way that you measure or the way that you manage, uh, you know, the extraction of raw materials, so to say, those would be more in line like the, the artificial legal personality rights of, you know, property in, in that sense would be more like, 
you know, something like a human right, um, rather than just purely a property right. There are these unalienable considerations that you can't like decouple from like the data itself. So um, true. So I just wanted to add that. Good. Um, any other uh, 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 feedback, questions, comments, musings on Christina's presentation? So uh, this is Bob. Um, I think your work is really important. Um, certainly as a company here in the U.S. that has had to react to CCPA, which is a California you know, Privacy Act, um, we anticipate that California is only the tip of the sword and that many other states will enact um, you know, laws similar to this. So we've taken a holistic approach across the entire country and have set up an entire team. So there are entire corporate legal privacy departments that are dying for solutions around this data ownership problem and how we might be able to mitigate that. So you're in fertile ground and quite frankly, might have great opportunities to consult with a number of companies yeah. Um, that are looking for solutions around this. There are empires to be built. I think you yeah, that's correct. <laughs> um, uh, any other feedback? Okay, well then let, let's all thank uh, Christina for a very thoughtful, thoughtful and timely presentation. Thank you, Christina. Nice work. Um, so next up we have um, Samuel. Um, so I'm not sure if you're in a position yet to present. But um, if so, come on off mute, and this is your time. And share your screen. Yeah, and share your screen. So um, just as a fail safe, um, the next two we have are uh, Bob Taylor and uh, Megan Ma. So Megan. Bob, why don't we go to you, and, um, and if, um, if uh, Samuel is able to join us, we'll, we'll slot him in after you. If you're, are you ready? Gonna share my screen. Okay, perfect. perfect though. <laughs> Sir Robert Taylor of Liberty Mutual. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so let me just go ahead and put this in presentation mode. Uh, so what I'm going to share with you today is um, a truncated version of something that we did at an actual use case at Liberty Mutual. So just to, on a very high level, um, what we wanted to do is train our uh, in-house lawyers to be better consumers of uh, data and to apply a data-driven approach to their litigation. And what we're finding, and we were having this conversation before class, is that many new lawyers, some of them are getting exposure to how to consume data and coming out data literate um, you know, from their law schools, but not enough. Um, but we're finding that mid-career professionals are having this uh, crisis of not feeling prepared on how to practice into the future. And so we're looking to not so much look into the future about what might be possible. What we're looking at is what's available today in terms of data-driven law and how can we exploit it to make better decisions faster in the life cycle of a litigated matter that leads to better outcomes. So that's what we're thinking about. So um, I'm gonna kind of cruise through a couple of these slides you know, um, you don't need a data analytics and an overview, but our, some of our internal folks did need it, and we explained this to them. And the one thing, and the reason I'm showing this slide that I wanted to point out is that um, the second um, bullet from the bottom around the fact that data-driven sites insights do not replace legal research or reasoning, but they are a supplement. I just want to enhance that thought a little bit. We had a another slide where we talked about, and you know, many of you remember, you know, Gary Kasparov when he you know, uh, lost, you know, uh, his chess match to Deep Blue, right? That was long ago, right? I mean, I'm talking about ancient history, but he had a very interesting um, comment after that. You would have thought, you know, he would have railed against it. And he went the other way and he embraced it. And he came up with a new game called Advanced Chess, where the human would partner with the computer against another human with the assistance of the computer. And they were playing a much higher level game. Yeah. So what we're proposing is that our practitioners practice advanced law, meaning that they have computer-assisted data at the ready combined with their own experience to make something greater or better. And I think that that's really what we were trying to do from a culture perspective is take away the fear that we're supplementing the judgment of these professionals with the data. That's not it at all. It's really enhancing it. 
Okay, so we're looking to kind of create a competitive advantage there. So uh, in our uh, pilot, this is kind of the overview. Um, really what we were looking to do is to enhance the effectiveness of our department, identify and understand what the current data usage and needs are of the individual folks. So these are litigation attorneys that oversee litigation outs that's being handled by lawyers outside the company. It could be employment litigation. It could be bad faith against Liberty Mutual. I know that's a shock that we might get sued for bad faith, but it happens occasionally. Um, or it could be a large you know, construction suit against one of our insurers. Right? So they're overseeing and strategizing around litigation. Um, we wanted to be able to produce analytics that were being able to be utilized and were actionable. Right? Otherwise, what's the use of consuming the data unless it gives you something that's actionable? We looked to measure the impact of the tools. We were really using these tools, and I'll get to them in a minute, um, on new cases. So we're still seeing the results of those cases come in. We would periodically survey the lawyers throughout to say, are you sharing this with outside counsel? What has been their reaction? Has it been useful to you in setting strategy or resetting strategy? Has it given you asymmetry of information, meaning that you have more information than the other party so that you can make strategic decisions sooner that might give you an advantage in litigation? So, you know, we're, we're doing these periodic check-ins. And then lastly, and this is something we're still working on, admittedly, we want to combine our proprietary data with publicly available data to do something really even more meaningful. So that's overlaying a public data set with our private and um, really giving us much greater insights. So we were calling that Analytics 2.0 mm -hmm. in our organization. So um, I talked a little bit about assessing the impact. Um, what we uh, committed to deliver to these folks was customized engagements with certain analytic providers, and I'll get to who those were in a minute, um, give them individual case consultations as they requested. So a lawyer might come to me and my team and say, I've got a new piece of litigation. I really could use some data on this. Um, we did consolidate their feedback and give that back to them. We gave them evaluations. We looked for evaluations on the platform and we did um, online demand training. And this was a big part um, of helping our lawyers advance and being able to use the tools. So at first we would fish for them, but ultimately we wanted to treat, teach them to fish for themselves or at least their paralegals and their support staff to fish for themselves. And that was really the idea. And then what we were looking to understand and what we got deep insight was on, on litigation strategy, the impact on case outcomes. Um, you know, did they really truly understand how to leverage analytics? Many of them didn't even understand how to incorporate analytics into their practice. And so this was a deep learning for many and kind of an aha moment. It was really nice to be part of that. Um, and then we were looking to see what kind of uh, tools outside counsel were using. And quite frankly, we found very little. Uh, we did look across the evolving space of um, analytics tools and legal uh, litigation analytics tools. This is not designed to be a comprehensive list by any means, but these are ones that we did take a deep look at and when we have experience and understand. Um, some of these tools we have in-house, some we don't, but um, some we've partnered with to kind of evaluate their data. But um, this is just to give you a little sense that there's a lot of players in this space and a lot of people trying to enter into this space and use interesting things. So here's the pilot platforms that we currently um, have been using. You know, no surprise in the upper left-hand quadrant is uh, Westlaw Edge. They've come a very long way in their ability to do uh, state-level analytics. This is one of the reasons we really like them. Um, although state analytics is where it's at for us. I mean, you know, for our company and for many others, uh, I think it's 90, four or 5% plus of our litigation is all in state courts rather than federal courts. On the right-hand side, Lex Machina, uh, some of you might be familiar, they are wholly owned by LexisNexis. They do an excellent job on federal uh, cases and leveraging PACER. Um, and they are a little bit more intentional about the case types that they go into and the domains. The lower left-hand side, uh, we went with a startup out of California, Gamalytics. Some of you might have heard of that. Uh, Rick Merrill is there. CEO, very interesting because they are going after uh, behavioral analytics around the uh, judges and state level yeah. court judges. And they started in California, but are expanding out. California is a big jurisdiction for us and they've been expanding Florida, New York and, and beyond. On the right hand side is something called Judicata. Uh, very interesting there. The, the interesting story there is, uh, while there's a lot of startups in this space, it's very expensive to do kind of this AI and so this, company has pulled back 
And so they no longer are offering uh, what we were looking at, which was a grief analyzer tool um, to kind of predict what the um, uh, viability of your particular motion might be, like a summary judgment motion, and find the gaps in it, and also kind of give you a prediction of how st the strength of your grief was relative to your opposition. Amazing, interesting concept, but they had to pull back a little bit because it's just an expensive endeavor. Mm -hmm. So those are the platforms that we have been offering. We've developed a series of checklists. This is just one example um, of when a case comes in, what are the things that people were interested in understanding and knowing about? So um, a paralegal or a, you know, even a legal librarian or a, a technologist might go in and use this checklist of surface materials before a lawyer even gets the case itself so that they're getting both the case dossier along with the analytics. We do that um, at intake, at a midpoint in discovery, and then at the decision point of prior to trial or settlement. So there's three separate checklists that we use. Um, we are a big uh, devotee of the Checklist Manifesto, um, and that's a book that we've uh, really uh, incorporated into our practice. So our learnings here is that uh, there was no real winner among these. Uh, each one has its you know, use for, depending on the use case. Um, you know, interacting directly with the platforms is better than giving static reports because the platforms themselves are dynamic with the filters. So it's much better to teach your lawyers to use this than to surface dynamic, uh, you know, static, you know, uh, PDF or, or you know, report documents. Um, combining the platforms gives optimal results. Um, we often found that you get different results with different platforms. And this is one of the issues that they're having right now and something, you know, called the the pacer problem, the data is full of typos, um, the code does not reflect the true focus of the matter, the names of parties are all a mess, it's prohibitively expensive, the user interface, and that can go on and on. Um, and then, you know, it just helped allow us to get um, a better sense of the strength and weaknesses of the various products themselves. But we've had tremendous adoption as a result of this pilot over the last year. So we did a scorecard on the current state. Um, you know, we found that the quality and reliability, I, I think, I thought this was a generous grade. It was a B minus. I might have given the C plus for where we are in the evolution, but, you know, we're getting there. Uh, the state level data is clearly evolving. We've got that PACER problem. And the platform training materials really varied. Uh, we had to develop some of those ourselves that were more customized. Um, integration, there's a little bit of a barrier in and adoption and culturally and, and some organizations. Outside council acceptance, uh, they were we found to be relatively low. Um, mm -hmm. They wanted to rely more on their own uh, experience and intuition, but I think we all understand, you know, one individual's experience is really, you know, ultimately what, uh, you know, statisticians would call a hunch rather than making yeah. data-driven decisions. Um, so we did find that it, it did work well, though, um, when you kind of gave them a personal experience. These tools are very easy to use. Uh, you, you can get up and using these really just by giving them a login and letting somebody play around. They're very intuitive. Um, there was expert guidance available and um, they're very well suited for collaboration. So we felt that that was good. So our rate of adoption has been very high, but we had to have a very intentional program to push this out. And it's still every day, um, you know, kind of a cultural challenge for us to push this into our organization. Um, it's becoming more of a more of a mandate. We were able to get our head of litigation, um, you know, uh, to be quoted in, a, in an article talking about how this is the future. So fully committed uh, to this uh, going forward. So um, that's really kind of what we've been doing. I think that um, there's some amazing tools that are available today um, that you can start using and you just need to, you know, start collaborating with them. And, you know, for me, um, I am highly interested and in if anyone has any ideas about how to upskill or uh, increase the technical competence of uh, mid-career lawyers so that they can be relevant over the next five, 10, or 15 years in the way that law is going to be practiced. And I'm keenly interested in the way that law students are being trained today to fill our pipeline for the demand and our needs to have people that are technically competent in our legal department and that can practice uh, data-driven law. Uh, here, here. <laughs> Excellent. Great presentation, Bob. Um, I have um, you know five or six days worth of feedback for you, but uh, <laughs> let me uh, butt my tongue here and see is anybody online um, have any uh, any reactions or or follow ups uh, for Bob based on 
based on all of that. I'd be interested, and this ties into a conversation Daz and I were having this morning, actually, um, Just like about uh, you know the process by which you come you came up with the checklist and how you decided to focus on the the various areas which uh, Liberty Mutual has. Yeah, I, I love that. So um, we really it was through kind of ethnography, right? So we went and watched what the lawyers were doing when they took in a case and asked them questions as they were doing their intake and their strategy and how they were filling out their case assessment and we interviewed them. You know, what is the first thing you need to know? Um, what does the information about the judge matter? Yes, why? What information are you trying to glean? So we did a series of interviews and just watching um, the way that people did their work and um, that was incredibly valuable to us and then we would develop a series of checklists, go back, get feedback, iterate, go back, feedback, iterate. And so, you know, these checklists are not designed to be permanent, like they're designed to be updated um, as, you know, we get better information or more feedback, but, you know, they're a pretty good sense of what you should be thinking about at various stages in the cases. So we really went to our expert litigators and saying, what are the things that you think about that help you get to a successful outcome? And how can we extract that knowledge from you and put it into a checklist so that, the newbie that comes along can have the same level of thought process at least, or try to gain the same level of thought process. So a lot of, you know, uh, kind of in the trenches, design yeah. thinking, ethnography and, and interviewing. Nice. Beautiful. Wow. Um, th this, it really is, uh, it, this very, this is very relevant to uh, what, what Brian and I have been doing. We're, as you said, we talked a little bit before class, but we're slowly get, starting to structure um, something through the Human Dynamics Lab uh, by way of uh, uh, sort of mid-career executive education course. Uh, and you know, some of that has to do with um, getting explicit about tacit knowledge. Uh, from experts with certain types of tools like analytics, mm -hmm. but also like legal reasoning and like litigation, uh, which is a, a process, tactical, um, and being able to express it in ways uh, that are, you know, that you could diagram mm -hmm. um, and that you could um, role play and that you could simulate uh, and base and ultimately extract, um, extract knowledge from that, you, you know, that you could absorb and uh, digest and then be able to, um, to um, practice and then ultimately can become unconscious knowledge basically that sort of yeah. guides how you work. I, I totally agree. I mean, we have a saying that I keep pushing out to my team, which is provide insights over information. And so, yeah. you know, I think people get overwhelmed with information, but they appreciate insights. So anytime you can provide them data in a way that can direct them to the insight they should be extracting from that, it's far more valuable than just shoving a data set at them or a set of graphs and expecting them to magically understand what the insight is they're supposed to draw from that. Yeah, so a lot of it is being able to sort of classify at a moment in time like intake or mid, exactly. mid point or toward the end. What, is the, what matters and why and what sorts of tools could get me there? That's exactly right. And, all with, and I want to emphasize our program and I think many other programs like this and within companies or law firms should all be designed with the focus of how can I make better decisions faster, yep. right? That give me a better chance of getting a better outcome at the end of the case. Yeah. That's really ultimately what we're, you're, you should be looking at not to lose sight of that. Yeah, I think the notion of checklist goes to an idea that not many in the law think about very often, but that would be the idea of scaling law or scaling legal processes. And that's exactly what happens when you move to an approach that's rooted in checklists that identify the like key components of a legal process. It collects data about them, and then you're able to use that data to subsequently automate or compute uh, legal outcomes. Yeah, I, I just, and I'll probably end with this, is I totally agree, and I think the checklists are cross-functional in that mm -hmm. if you want to create an expert system, yeah, right? Um, one of the places you may want to start, right, is by developing a checklist and extracting the knowledge from the subject matter mm -hmm. expert through that. 
and use the checklist almost as your yeah. first level draft of code as to how you're going to arrange, um, you know, your low code or no code, you know, yeah. um, expert you know, system. So, so here's a, a parting thought. Um, when you're doing um, uh, like a big, a big software system, um, one way to, one approach to understanding it is, um, is modeling. And one approach for modeling that's, that has the, uh, well, the benefit of being complete um, is um, it's uh, um, codified in something called unified modeling language, UML. Um, and so if you, if you break down UML, there's seven types of diagrams, uh, you know, um, like, like state change, um, there's um, you know, entity relationship, uh, and then one of the core ones is sequence diagrams, which is a, is a way to encode checklists, among other things, and other types of sequences, and you know, like logic trees or whatever, you know, forks and, and so forth. There's use cases, there's a few others. But um, now that you've gotten really good at checklists, um, do a Wikipedia search or, or like a web search for just what are the seven types of diagrams and get like, you know, 10 examples of each one and maybe think about what, what it might look like to start to fill out um, your um, elicitation of the different dimensions of what's going on. Because uh, if you are able to diagram out all seven uh, dimensions of a, of a UML diagram of a system, because of the nomenclature of how, you know, the, what the arrows and the circles and the squares mean, you can actually hit a button in some software packages like uh, Rational Rows or others, and it will um, encode it as like C++ or Java, like it will make a working system. And people that are good at these languages swear to me you wouldn't want to necessarily use that code, but the code compiles and it works. And it, it says that there's a one-to-one -one, um, equivalence between uh, like the, com the, the like complete expression of, of the software pro package in, in pictures, like diagrams, like hieroglyphics that anybody should be able to understand and, and working code. So, uh, but the sequence, you know, I don't know, sequence Uber Alice in some ways, like in checklists, yeah. uh, you know. Deserve a manifesto. So th 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 thanks, Bob. Great, right. great work. Thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe you need to, maybe you should come and do a lecture next year. <laughs> um, so now we've got um, uh, one and a half more, I think. Um, oh, there's a question uh, for Bob, it looks like, in another system. So uh, before we go to that question, uh, let me just ask, is there any, can we, have unanimous consent to go uh, to uh, 3.45, basically 15 minutes be beyond what we thought we were going to do. Uh, it's 3.30 now. Any objections to that? No. Okay. Hearing no objections, if anyone, if anyone has to jump off, um, we'll send the video so you can, you can catch up, but, uh, but the session will remain 15 minutes longer. Let's see if we can nail this question very quickly, and then we'll go to uh, Megan and then show Samuel's video. Um, a question for Bob. According to behavioral science, judges may be irrational. Um, how can a checklist manage that? <laughs> um, <as> in, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I would agree that judges can be irrational. Um, I think that if you have a large enough data set of any individual's results over time, you can draw interesting conclusions uh, from that or deduce you know, a way to kind of confront. So if you know you've got somebody that's irrational, that is enough to at least guide your behavior in some way. And that's one of the reasons why we like the analytics for that reason. Um, however, I would suggest, yes, you can get people to be irrational, but most of the time people act fairly consistently, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, it's that that we're relying on. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, so the real, so one of the great things about doing, um, you know, kind of like judge behavioral analytics is that you don't get in the trap of what would a law professor say they should have ruled on that motion or that objection. You get to what did they actually do, rational or irrational. What we have isn't um, so much a, a rational analysis, we have a predictable analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at trial, but that's what you wanna know is yeah. able to predict what's likely to happen. Well, so um, one of the things that we actually train um, is don't tell the judge what you think the law is tailor your argument to what the judge thinks the law is. <laughs> so, so much wisdom in that. You know, and, and, and so many people want to you know, argue and prove themselves right. And it's very easy using these tools to drill down to the actual dockets of the individual cases, extract 
the actual rulings that a judge made on a summary judgment motion, find out what the president was that they relied on. Whether you agree whether that's the president they should have relied on or not, you darn well better cite it in your case going back to that judge. So I guess that's the best way I can answer that question. Here, here. Um, thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks. So n next up, we've got uh, uh, Megan Ma. Uh, Megan, um, you're, if you have slides. Uh, hi, Megan. Hi. Hi, hey, Megan. Hi. Um, thanks for letting me present. Um, of course, um, basically what I want to talk about today is actually an ongoing collaboration that I've had with myself and a computer scientist and a mathematician, actually. Um, and the project is fundamentally on translation or testing sort of translation from legal text to numerical form. Um, so I'll just pull up some of the slides. I'll go as quickly as I can just so that I know um, waste any more time or um, in case anyone has to leave. Um, how do I? There should be a, a green box in the bottom of the Zoom window that says share. Does anyone see it? Yeah, oh, yep. Okay, um, so I'll just turn off my camera. Um, so essentially, um, of course, when we look at other people's projects, for example, Neha's project, it was fundam fundamentally about sort of this movement from legal texts and descriptive natural language to numeric form. Um, a lot of what we see in existing law, it appears in this kind of formula logically reducible if-then statements. So of course, the question that we brought before us is, could translation be possible? Um, a lot of what people have seen is how do we simplify it? How do we turn this into something more structured? Um, so one of the interesting articles I came across was one written by Douglas Hofstadter, who is a really, um, who is a translator. And he talked about the shallowness of Google Translate and he's largely spoke of the Chinese room argument, which for those who don't know, is it's a thought experiment first published by John Searle in the 1980s. Um, and it's about how syntactic rule following is not really equivalent to understanding. So of course he probed at this sort of important question, does translation require understanding? Um, his experiments obviously try to say no, um, the purpose of the language is beyond sort of this processing of text. It requires imagining and remembering. Um, it's a lifetime of experience and of using words in a meaningful way. So I tried to reflect on what he had written, um, and I looked into actually a historian called Yulia Frumer, and she's a historian of sciences. So science is obviously a field where the language that is used has a sort of reputation of universality. So what she had considered was a historical example of these 18th century Japanese scientific texts and what they, wa they were from were actually Dutch translations. And so between Dutch and Japanese, they don't actually share similar intellectual languages. Sorry, I am not using my PowerPoint very well. <laughs> um, and what she kind of saw was that there required actually a conceptual transfer. So it's a sort of situation of ideas in different conceptual worlds and that you needed a migration between these conceptual worlds in order for translation to actually take place. So does this mean that with new experiences we will get sort of these new interpretations? Um, Marie Hildebrandt, who is a legal scholar, actually questioned or teased this premise um, on addressing the challenge of translation. And what she saw was that actually in order for um, translation to occur, we need to first understand um, what exactly is the sort of language of statistics, right? We need to learn the language of statistics in order for us to properly reason and understand between what exists in text-driven law, so what's in descriptive natural language, to a sort of numerical form. Um, of course, when we think of translation, there is the risk of being lost in translation. Um, things that don't quite move in the exact same way. Um, so the larger question is, of course, could law behave like mathematics? And what was brought to the attention before um, 
was the World Justice Project, the Rule of Law Index. Um, and it's fundamentally kind of taking a qualitative assessment, the rule of law, and transforming it into a quantitative tool. Um, what's interesting actually is not really how, um, what this rule of law index is sort of like created from, but actually how they measured adherence to the rule of law, which is that um, it kind of uses their own world justice projects, their own principles in order to make this evaluation. So then the question becomes, what are the sorts of risks involved with kind of identifying the rule of law in this numeric context? And a numeric context that was created um, based on evaluation was somewhat internally created. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead. What I've tried, what is also in sort of our ongoing paper was this historical perspective of how governing numbers is not novel. It's existed since, you know, Aristotle and to Leibniz and Boole. Um, but I want to kind of center it on what exactly is our project given this background. So ours kind of tackles this semantic conundrum of what is the significance of meaning in legal language. And what we saw is from a statistic standpoint, meaning is approximated. Um, they could apply word analogies as the logical basis and meaning is gauged by the statistical probability of the response. So in recognizing the context and relationship between words, meaning sort of hinges on the frequency of its appearance in a particular setup. Um, the project tests translation then by identifying the rate of convergence in the meaning of legal terms. So in determining the sort of rate of convergence, the project is tackling the existence of legal concepts. Um, the crux of the project is twofold. It analyzes the processes involved with legal interpretation and reasoning and critically assesses them against the function of law. So how we'll try to do this is that we're going to be using U.S. Supreme Court cases from the 1700s to 2019. Um, the, and that's sort of our working data. The, then we'll be applying NLP technology, so specifically word to vec to parse legal documents. Our hypothesis is that by analyzing the components of legal language with these techniques, we can actually begin to translate law to numerical form. Um, moreover, it's interesting to understand what's the importance of contextual understanding um, in order to sort of recognize the significance of meaning in legal language. So what I mean by all this is that actually this isn't necessarily new. Um, what it's existed before in, um, there's a paper that came out um, about roughly a year ago um, called the Deep Learning in Law, Early Adaptation and Legal Word Embeddings Trained on Large Corpora. Essentially what it is, is that they've created something called the Law to Vec, and they've taken legislation Translation from it, from English sort of base countries, inc including some sort of um, legislation from translations, and they took this and tried to sort of pull out um, word associations. So they have a table where, for example, they pulled out words like article, and what they noticed were sort of like the top um, similarities or top meanings were convention, section, clause, provisions. Um, we are trying to take it one step further because a lot of the cases that we do find in the U.S. Supreme Court opinions is actually that meaning or interpretation takes place in words that aren't what we would theoretically consider as legal. So the words that, you know, this article that existed, the Law to Vec article, was pulling out things like crime, pulling out things like felony, security, fraud, things that they might see as legal words. Um, what, we were, what we're trying to do by parsing these legal documents is looking at cases, for example, like the 1993 case, um, Smith versus United States. Scalia has a famous dissenting opinion where he questions the word use and the use of, for example, arms. And in this case, sort of, um, for those who don't know, is that um, what happened is, is there's, there was an illegal exchange where someone had exchanged firearms um, for cocaine. And it was brought before the court, is this considered a use of arms? 
Um, so this sorts of stuff is what makes interpretation interesting. So we're trying to see, can this sort of translation exist from this descriptive natural language to numerical form in things that are like very normal words like use? Um, and we'll obviously be looking at the context in which this word is seated. So yeah, so thank you very much. Outstanding. We love it. We always, anytime word to vec is part of a presentation, we get excited. Um, nice job. Um, any, um, any, any uh, reactions to that? I, I have to notice that there's some, some resonance with, okay. with the first presentation from, from Neha. Anybody have any any feedback uh, for Megan? So Megan, this is Bob. I'm just curious about um, you might have mentioned, but are you publishing the results of the analysis from the Supreme Court cases? Like, how how might we be able to consume this? Um, so this will be uh, so right now the our um, so Dimitri who. Um, so I think I've listed their names. So myself, I'm sort of, I guess, the jurist um, behind it. Um, Avalon is the mathematician and Dimitri is the computer scientist. So he's actually working with the corpora right now. Um, our, it's going to be, it's, it's taking a bit of time, but um, we're hoping to publish this by the um, end. We're hoping by summer. Um, and I think we'll try to get a first like running draft with um, the MIT computational report, if that's okay. <laughs> yes, I, I can see, confirm that that's celebration. Okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why we want to sort of get put out feelers um, with my presentation. Um, I couldn't okay. actually, a lot of my part is the where I'm attempting more of like the philosophy of logic and language and legal theory. Um, that's sort of my portion. And I'm going to take sort of this knowledge and try to communicate in um, the best way I could um, to liaise with uh, Dimitri, who will kind of assess what ex what are the words we want to pull out. Um, because right now, what exists with Law to Vec is that obviously um, they're taking what is perceivably just legal words. Um, we're looking at focusing on meaning interpretation and what approximating meaning and how that differs from actually the act of interpreting. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I, I especially love the, uh, the reference to the translation efforts uh, that Douglas Hofstad is doing. Um, he's, he's got a book called I Am a Strange Loop. That, I would recommend um, everybody to read. And he also has a lecture, uh, the Stanford presi presidential lecture, which he gave uh, some years ago on the idea of analogy as uh, the core of cognition. And um, in, in that lecture and in, his, uh, and in his book, he does a lot of you know, describing ways to formally represent words, numbers, and concepts like this. And, and so I think, you know, that is definitely like one of the big meta themes that we have is like, okay, well, how do you distill law, which is kind of this, uh, you know, kind of nebulous thing. Um, it's not as precise as it could be. How do you distill that into these kind of concrete, you know, checklistable sort of functions that then you can start and like evaluating the relationships of them. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I found this especially like, I think this is uh, very needed um and and the the i had a i had a question um which is uh, are you guys using the harvard case law access project data or where are you getting your data from um yes actually we so there was a um i can't remember the school for now but the it was called legal linguistics and they put sort of um these cases online through their database oh cool so um, I need to go back to which school that was, but basically they've put it all online and we just took that and we ran with it. If, if that's public, I, I think it would be really great to share that in the Telegram channel. Um, I know we'd like to look at it. Indeed, yeah, and, uh, and just to follow up on your previous beautiful statement about, about uh, publishing the MIT Computational Law Report, um, we had a quick, 
editorial meeting uh -huh. um, after you said that here. Um, <laughs> we announced that we would accept your on that data uh, and so forward a little bit and then ultimately where may, maybe there's some aspect or aspects of your or parts of your um, article where people could try to reproduce your results and that, that's really the the gold standard that we're going for and um, that's some of what we could uh, bring to the table unlike stodgy old paper law reviews <laughs> can't help you that way so the i do have to mention that um in terms of the data that we've taken um, it wasn't in a plain text format. What happened is, is that they've simply given a list of sort of all of the U.S. Supreme Court cases from the 1700s until 2019. And what Dimitri has helpfully done and why it's taking a while is because he sort of had to pull it up and he's created sort of this, um, uh, he's created this uh, algorithm to actually pull out the plain text. Oh, so, oh, it it was effectively had a list of all of the cases. Beautiful. Um, one other quick observation. Um, as you go to the, the you know, kind of like next levels of of analysis, um, some things to I'm just sort of synthesizing best of um some of the things we've tried to do here at law.mit.edu or in our computational law research program, but, but also pulling threads from you know, groups like um, uh, International Conference of AI and Law, which has been around for you know, decades. Um, you can, if you can, you know, like the simple way to say, to talk about it for modern data science is entity extraction. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the deeper, what's most relevant there for, in a legal context is you can start to identify the roles so yeah, it's Exxon, great, or it's you know Acme, LLC. That, that's critical to identify the parties. But what role did they play here that was relevant in the case? So you know this this most superficial one is plaintiff, plaintiff, defendant, 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 plaintiff, plaintiff. But there's a substantive role. So they were like um, you know they were um you know like landowner um you know pursuing a trespass claim. They were tort feeser. They were you know whatever, they, they had a certain uh, role and, and the other parties had certain roles. Identifying what those were is, you, is like um, jet fuel for analytics. And then from there you can start to get to relationships uh, or, or well, act, it's actors and actions, but the, the, beyond the action, like, you know, there's some event like, you know, the tanker exploded and leaked oil or whatever, something happened. But then there's also, um, it, 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 the action can be understood once you've identified the legally relevant roles as basically relationships. Um, so, you know, you had like uh, someone that was like their relationship was they were in a butter, like sure their landowner is a role, but they were in a butter and that really matters because that's a whole different legal framework. So roles and relationships um, of the actors and actions is something that you might be able to make progress on once you've got the data in a structured way. You may be able to start to assign those, or even if you can assign it to, you know, like a tenth or a quarter of the corpus, well, then you, you can make potentially real progress on that subset of the of the corpora that that you're uh, that that you've extracted with uh, with the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Almost like the head notes that yeah. you know Thompson West would pull out right to kind of yeah. draw out keynote you know, items, right? Bullseye. Yeah, that's that's a really smart idea. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is still an idea, you know, whose time is in the future, but we think we think that this will be one of the purposes of computational law is to have, you know, almost like auto-magically um, self-deriving headnotes, um, including for things that are emerging right now or coming across your desk that are being published by Westlaw. Um, so, Let's see. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments uh, for for Megan? Brian, you listening would be proud of how many times the word corpora was used. Yes. Yeah, we love your use of the of the word corpora, the plural of corpus. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you very much. It is outstanding presentation. Thank you so much for sharing it. Great.
Yay. Um, and I think we've got one last one, which we'll have to do quite Actually, I don't think technically we're in a good position. To, I don't think Zoom will let us play a video. I can uh, speak here. You could, but the audio doesn't. Oh, the it doesn't, audio wouldn't come through. Yeah, we, oh, we, we have to pipe the audio. We don't have the software for that. Yeah. Um, so so let, let's just give um, Samuel one more chance to see if, he, if he's able to. Yeah, I know his connection's bad. Present. Um, so Samuel, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't think we're going to be able to do the presentation for you, basically. Uh, and so part of it is uh, is Q and A. We will post log going um, in telephone for usually on Yeah, yeah actually, throw, we never kill them really. But I'll throw the video in right now so that everybody um, can view it. Great. So so. We With that, um, uh, so kind of final, any final feedback? Um, I'm offline, but uh, uh, so th I want to thank everybody for making this a, a really great class and the, the quality of the final presentations I thought was really, really yeah. illuminating. Um, I'm almost starting to think next year we should do the presentations like on the second day and then spend the third day discussing them and going deeper. Um, yeah, we can and, space it out there. Yeah, maybe space it out differently. Um, but but the, uh, really, really impressed and uh, delighted by the presentations. And, and we hope that you will stick with us through the year um, by going to law.mit.edu, get on our mailing list if you're not. And we're going to start a monthly community building call um, where we'll come together and have um, some people will do quick updates on breakthroughs in computational law or something like that. That, but then mostly have an opportunity for people to talk, um, ask questions, introduce themselves, and um, and have uh, catalyze more idea flow is what we call it. Um, so that's among among the things we'll be doing uh, coming up next. And um, we also have a big event brewing um, for the end of April or the beginning of May here at MIT. Um, it'll be a computational law summit. Um, but so uh, if you're if you've ever wanted to come to MIT in the springtime where it's actually nice um, here and not at the frozen tundra, that would be a great opportunity for you to do it. And yes, of course, you can join us remotely. Uh, so with that, uh, let, let's, uh, yeah. let's close up the class, shall we? I think, uh, Thanks I, very much, guys. We had a gavel. <laughs> yep. So the iPhone gavel app has been invoked, and this session is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody, and I hope to see you next year. Thank you for you. Bye-bye.